guard the good deposit entrusted to you by the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Guarding the deposit of faith is the mission which the Lord has entrusted to his church and which she fulfills in every age. This treasure, received from the apostles, has been faithfully guarded by their successors. All Christ faithful are called to hand it on from generation to generation by professing the faith, by living it in fraternal sharing, and by celebrating it in liturgy and prayer. The church is teaching on eschatology, or about the last end of man and the world, is found in three articles of the creed and in the catechism. Article 7, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. Article 11, I believe in the resurrection of the body. And Article 12, I believe in life everlasting. And in these three articles we find a summation of this field of eschatology, which means words about the end or about the last things from the Greek word eschaton used in the Bible uh, for the end of the ages. Within the divine economy of salvation, eschatology tells us about creation's purpose, its telos, its end, what it's created for and how it can get there. Commonly we think of the four last things which has traditionally been taught in catechisms uh, uh, ancient and modern, and that is death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Because each of us and the world itself is subject to dying, to judgment by God, and to a destiny, either a glorious destiny, such as heaven, or an ignominious destiny, destiny, hell. Now, this would seem to be something not to be too concerned about. It doesn't seem to have much to do with our everyday life. But in reality, everybody that lives has an eschatology. It can be a secular eschatology that is entirely materialistic, in which the goal and the end of life and existence is surely self-satisfaction or prestige in one's profession or even much more mundane things such as pleasure and, and, and so on, or sexual happiness. These kinds of things will be the motive why people live and what, uh, where they direct their lives to. Eschatology can be based on science. It can be based on Marxism, such as in socialism and communism. It can be based on humanism, such as in Freemasonry and in, and in various non-Christian humanisms. It can be based on religion, such as we see in Judaism, or the various eschatologies held by different groups of Protestants, or by the Mormons or the Jehovah Witnesses, or by Islam. All of these things are the goals to which those religions are directing the people who adhere to those religions. Now it should be clear then that if people are directed to certain goals, they're going to bring that purpose into everyday affairs into their own personal morality, into the culture, into politics, uh, into life in general. So it's important to know that on the one hand that people have a purpose and an end to their life to which they are directing themselves. 
but also to know that we have a purpose and an end. And our purpose and end gives us hope because our end is God himself. In Colossians chapter 1, we're told that he, Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. That sums up the means that God has used to bring us and direct us to our end, which is him, from the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve, to the final day of history, that in and through Christ we are directed to the Father. And what is interesting about this is it's very Trinitarian and it's very Christological. Because creation comes from the wisdom of the Father through the Son, who is the Father's divine word, and it's the Holy Spirit who, hovering over the water, has effected creation. And the redemption has come through the will of the Father in the incarnation of the Son in the womb of Mary with the Holy Spirit overshadowing Our Lady. And all of this, this creation and man, will go back to the Father through Christ, through the sanctification and glorification that the Holy Spirit will work in us and even in the entire universe. So the church's eschatology is very Trinitarian and very Christological as it needs to be because it reflects this beautiful divine plan from by which we came from God and through and in Christ we will go back to him at the end of our lives and the world at the end of human history. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, St. Paul tells us regarding Christ's reign. For he must reign till he hath put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued under him, then shall the Son also himself be subject under him, unto him, that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. In this divine plan, Christ has come into the world with the means to bring us to God. And he subjects the world to God, not by the sword, but by virtue of the swords, if you will, in his kingdom of the gospel, the sword of the word, of the sacraments, the sacraments of initiation, all, all the seven sacraments. This is how Christ reigns in the world since he ascended to the Father. And in no other way, not by political kingdom, but only in this means, he will subject all things to himself and then he will turn that over to the Father. Now, we use the language of kingdom almost as a historical accident. Because if you remember the Old Testament, the Jewish people, looking at their neighbors and seeing that they had kings, insisted with God that they be given a king. And God was actually upset because uh, he had been giving them judges, these charismatic personalities who prophetically gave the people his word. But this didn't satisfy the Israelites. They needed a king, and so he gave them a king. First Saul, and then David. And so by virtue of this providence, the Savior is the son of David. And his kingdom would have been Israel had he been accepted uh, by his people. But he reigns now in the kingdom, which is the kingdom of his father, as Messiah and king. The son of David entered upon his reign as Messiah and king, not upon an earthly throne, but upon the cross. And so the hope of Israel, the Messiah, 
indeed the hope of all mankind, was not realized in the glory of a political kingdom. Rather, it was realized in himself, through his subjection to the Father, and will ultimately be full, fully realized when everything in the universe, including man, is also subject to the Father. So in this age, the age from the first uh, coming of our Lord and his second coming, this church age, if you will, Christ is reigning within the church. Christ's instruments are the sacraments by which he extends his kingdom and which he perpetuates it and grows it in us. These acts, actions of grace uh, which he has given his church. And so they not only initiate us into the kingdom, but allow it to be realized in us, in each of us, and ultimately at the time of our death, when we enter into that kingdom in the fullest sense, only uh, prescinding from the resurrection of the body at the end of time. The Catechism puts it this way in paragraph 671. Though already present in his church, Christ's reign is nevertheless yet to be fulfilled with power and great glory by the king's return to earth. This reign is still under attack by the evil powers, even though they have been defeated definitively by Christ's Passover. And until everything is subject to him, until there be realized new heavens and new earth in which justice dwells, the pilgrim church in her sacraments and institutions which belong to this present age, carries the mark of this world which will pass, and she herself takes her place among the creatures which groan and travail yet and await the revelation of the sons of God. This gives us, I think, a good insight into the travails of the church as well as she moves through history, that the church will be subject to defections, to apostasies, to heresies, to the sins of her members, even the highest members of the, of the church in terms of offices and so on. But yet this earthly travail will nonetheless be realized in glory at the end of time when Christ returns, for everything will be purified. Now this idea of the imminence of Christ's coming is something that Scripture also teaches. And it does sort of create perhaps a problem for us because clearly 19 centuries, 20 centuries have passed. How do we still expect that Christ's coming is imminent? We do not know the day or the, or the hour, as Scripture tells us, but it also tells us we can discern the signs. And so in every generation, that discernment takes place. Now, the Catechism speaks of a reason why this re, uh, return of the Lord is suspended. It teaches us and says that Christ's coming is suspended until the recognition of Christ by all of Israel. Uh, this is a doctrine which St. Paul also taught in, the, in his letter to the Romans, when he says that a hardening has come on part of Israel but it's for the sake of the Gentiles that the church will go out to the world and convert the Gentiles, and at the end, Israel will receive Christ. The Catechism, quoting the sort of the, the summation of the fathers on this point, says that the full inclusion of the Jewish people in the Messiah's salvation will occur in the wake of the full number of the Gentiles. And this will enable the people of God, both of the Old Covenant and of the New, to achieve the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that God may be all in all. So that would clearly be, we, have, we could see, we have two signs there, that on the one hand, the fullness of the Gentiles. When will that fullness occur? Has it occurred now? The inclusion of the Jews into that. When has, has that occurred to now? It has not. But it will occur at some future date, and that will be a sign that the end is imminent. In chapter 11 of Romans, uh, Paul says, Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon the part of Israel until the full number of Gentiles come in. 
And in so all Israel will be saved. For it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So these two signs are the first signs of the fathers. The fullness of the Gentiles and the conversion of the Jews. Before Jesus returns, the church will pass through a trial. We think of this as what Jesus himself had to pass through. Golgotha, Calvary, and ultimately his death and resurrection. This will be the fate also of the church and of Christians. We can't expect that we will be favored beyond what our Lord was favored. In fact, he said as much when he said to the women, if they do this to the green wood, what will they do to the dry? Christ was the green wood who went through a horrible uh, suffering for the sake of the salvation of the world. And so the church will go through a trial that is obviously not as horrible as our Lord's, but at the same time will conform us even more and more uh, to him. In paragraph 675, the Catechism teaches, Before Christ's second coming, the church must pass through a final trial that will shake the faith of many believers. The persecution that accompanies her pilgrimage on earth will unveil the mystery of iniquity in the form of a religious deception, offering men an apparent solution to their problems at the price of apostasy from the truth. The supreme religious deception is that of the Antichrist, a pseudo-messianism, by which man glorifies himself in place of God and of his Messiah come in the flesh. So this gives us an idea of what the, uh, what the trial will be about. It will be some version of the exaltation of man versus the, ex, uh, the glory that is due and honor due to God. And that as a consequence of this, the church uh, will itself be uh, persecuted. But the church, the catechism is also ruling out here uh, any other views of a messianism, such as a political messianism. Or, as I noted earlier, in eschatology, which in some, uh, some non-Catholic uh, theologies would suggest that the Lord will come and reign politically, physically upon the earth. These kinds of millenarianisms, as they're called, or messianisms uh, also would be appropriate, are, are not in keeping with what scripture and tradition tells us. Now going on, the Catechism explains a little bit more about the Antichrist deception when it says in 676 that it begins to take shape in the world every time the claim is made to realize within history that messianic hope which can only be realized beyond history through the eschatological judgment. The church has rejected even modified forms of this falsification of the kingdom to come under the name of millenarianism, especially the intrinsically perverse political form of secular messianism. So this is referring to the idea, in essence, that man is perfectible, that society is perfectible, that if we simply perfect human structures, justice, peace, and order will be established. Justice, peace, and order cannot be established because man is disordered. And so therefore this will continue until the end of time. And so only with Christ's return will everything be set straight. So that is the affirmative teaching of the church, that the kingdom can only be established not through, as the Catechism says, a progressive perfection, but only by Christ's return and the complete uh, overcoming by him of the evil that is in the world. Only by God's victory over the final unleashing of evil will cause the bride to come down from heaven. This final judgment, then, is the cataclysm that will purify and cleanse the world and bring about the perfection of the kingdom which is promised and hoped for by all of God's people. The final cosmic upheaval which is connected with the last judgment will be one and is one that was announced by Jesus himself in his preaching. 
He tells us that the secrets of hearts will be brought to light, as well as the conduct of each person towards God. Christ, who is the Lord of eternal life, has the full right to pass definitive judgment on works and hearts of men, since they belong to him, as he is the Redeemer of the world. Christ himself said while he was with his apostles that he came not to judge the world. In that first coming was his meaning. But in his second coming, he will judge the world. He will judge the works of each and reveal the secrets of all hearts. By rejecting God's grace in this life, one already judges himself, of course, and receives according to one's works. Certainly something that we know because very often the evil that we do has consequences quite apart from any punishment that uh, the state or ourselves or those in authority over us would have. And by such acts, we even condemn ourselves for eternity when we reject the spirit of love and the offer of forgiveness which God gives us. So the chronology so far we have of the signs of the times which the fathers find in sacred scripture are the conversion of the full number of the Gentiles, the conversion of Israel in the wake of the full number of the Gentiles, the last persecution of the church and the manifestation of the Antichrist, Christ destroying the Antichrist by his glorious return, and the cosmic upheaval which takes place to transform the world and which is in connection with the last judgment of all men and women. The resurrection of the body is a doctrine which was only progressively revealed by God in sacred scripture and fully revealed uh, in the New Testament. We see in certain Old Testament texts such as Ezekiel's vision of the valley of the bones which came to life in chapter 37 of his book, uh, a certain prefigurement of the doctrine even though it was related to Israel's uh, condition in the world at that time. We also see in a more direct way in 2 Maccabees uh, chapter 7, uh, the martyrs, the Maccabean martyrs who are put to death confess that, quote, the king of the universe will raise us up to everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws, unquote. And so there we have a more positive statement uh, of the doctrine uh, hinted at in other places as well besides Ezekiel such as Daniel in uh, chapter 12 of Daniel, in which many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, come to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, by the time that our Lord came into the world, there were yet various views among the Jewish people regarding the resurrection. The Pharisees, who held not only to the Torah, the five books of Moses, but also to the historical writing books called the writings, as well as to the prophetic books, believed in the resurrection because, for example, those texts I just read uh, that point to it. The Sadducees, a different party, uh, on the other hand, and one very much connected to the priesthood of the temple, did not be believe in the resurrection. And so we even see the Pharisees and Sadducees contesting, as it were, by involving Jesus and asking Provocative questions, such as in Matthew 19 and elsewhere, uh, regarding what, what is the fate of those who die. Jesus, of course, did teach the resurrection, uh, not only by saying that God was not the God only, only of the dead, but also of the living, with respect to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the others who had died before. And then he even connected it to his own resurrection by saying that I am the resurrection and the life, an expression that the apostles must have pondered until the Easter morning when they finally got a glimpse of the reality of all that they had been living through and had experienced and how significant these promises of Christ in their fulfillment were. The encounters of the disciples with the risen Christ certainly ingrained that reality into the mind not only of those who met him on the road to Emmaus, but especially St. Paul in his encounter on the road to Damascus, turning him into the great apostle of the Gentiles. 
And finally, all of those who heard the teaching of the apostles heard the witnesses of men who were in fact apostles because they not only had heard what Jesus taught, but they had witnessed his resurrection. And that was the key fact of the kerygma, of the gospel, that Jesus Christ is risen, and this is the hope of everything else, and what gives hope to everything else that the apostles taught and which the church teaches today. The idea of resurrection is something that is difficult to understand, certainly. When St. Paul taught in the Areopagus, as recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, when he got to that doctrine, the Greeks scoffed at him. And throughout history, men have scoffed at the idea of the resurrection. How can a resurrection occur? But we have in the faith, we have an explanation of the nature of man, and even the nature of resurrection, which allows us to see perhaps into the mystery, the great mystery that the resurrection is, ever so little, but enough, to, I think, to satisfy our curiosity. In death, we speak of the separation of the soul and the body. When God creates us and infuses the soul into that matter, there is a perfect unity, a simple unity between body and soul. The soul, as it were, loves the body, and the body loves the soul. And this union is difficult, broken with difficulty. But when biological death occurs, metaphysical death, the separation of the soul and the body, often follows very quickly. We know that people can sometimes be resuscitated, but that's because metaphysical, although biological death may have occurred, metaphysical death has not, and so some some ver resuscitation can be accomplished. But once the soul has separated from the body, no one but God can put it back. And so the body goes to corruption, and the soul goes to judgment. Christ, of course, at the end of time, will change this lowly body which we had, which corrupted in the earth, and restore it. Restore it to an identity to to the person uh, that, it, uh, that it came from or was united with, but not in such a way necessarily that every molecule is the same, but there is a real identity of the body. This certainly is something that exceeds our imagination and is accessible only to faith. But yet we have, for example, in the writings of St. Irenaeus against the her uh, heretics of his day, he says, just as bread that comes from the earth after God's blessing has been invoked upon is no longer ordinary bread, but the Eucharist formed of two things, the one earthly and the one heavenly, so too our bodies which partake of the Eucharist are no longer corruptible, but possess the hope of resurrection. Resurrection of the dead won't occur, of course, until the last day, at the very end of world, the world, at the very end of history. And it's closely associated with Christ's parousia, his second coming, which we've already noted that the second coming, the cosmic upheaval, the last judgment, the resurrection of the dead, these things are bound up together and in many respects are, are of one event or closely allied. In Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians, Paul tells us, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangel's call and the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So we will rise in Christ because we possess Christ in this life. And we will rise with Christ because he has proceeded us through his resurrection on Easter morn. And he will raise us up on the last day by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we already participate in that. As I said, the kingdom is one which is brought to us in the church, in the sacraments, especially in the Eucharist. And so the kingdom is alive in us, which means that eschatological hope is alive with us. And the seed of that eschatological renewal is alive in us. And it will only take those final acts of God at the end of time in history to bring that seed to flowering and fruition uh, in the kingdom of God.
Paul tells us in Colossians 2, you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So united with Christ by baptism, believers already participate in that heavenly life, and their body and soul participate in the dignity of belonging to Christ. And this demands that, of course, that we treat our bodies well in life, but also in death with a burial, with a funeral, and, and so on, that shows uh, the respect that we have uh, for the body, especially the bodies of those who have received the Eucharist uh, during their life. As St. Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. And he could have added, and God will one day glorify you in that body as well. In Hebrews, the sacred author tells us, it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment. There is only the one death we talked about earlier, that metaphysical death when our soul is separated from our body and our body is left to corrupt in the earth. Man, you remember you, man, you are dust and to dust you shall return. And so it will be for all men and women who have ever lived. The separated soul goes before Christ to be judged and to receive its reward or punishment according to those works done in the body and there are, of course, many texts in sacred scripture in the kingdom parable, parables in Matthew in which we are led to understand how this body and what we do in it determines whether we receive mercy or justice, reward or punishment uh, at the end of time. And so our body returns to dust to await the resurrection of the dead and the reunion with the soul which will give us that full integrity of our human nature, such as God originally planned it, and which Adam and Eve spoiled. In a certain sense, we've already seen how, through baptism, through the sacraments, we are living in Christ. But what does it mean then to die in Christ? Death is natural, of course, because although it was not God's original design that Adam and Eve die, we know that because of the sin they committed, that it became necessary as part of their punishment, part of their reparation, if you will, that they experience their mortality. This is why St. Paul, in his letter to the Romans, chapter 6, calls death the wages of sin, one of those consequences that comes to us because of the sin of Adam and Eve and which we experience certainly because of our own sins as well. In paragraph 1008, the Catechism states, the Church's magisterium as authentic interpreter of scripture and tradition teaches that death entered the world on account of man's sin. Even though man's nature is mortal, God had destined him not to die. Death was therefore contrary to the plans of God the Creator and entered in the world as a consequence of sin. Bodily death, then, is something that we already receive as a penalty for sin. And in that sense, it is our enemy. But in another sense, it's a blessing because of Christ, who gives himself through the graces of the sacraments and through the grace of the divine life within us, that anticipation of the heavenly glory, of the glory which Adam and Eve would have received more or less immediately after some uh, assumption or elevation to, into eternal life, but which because of their sin now we must die. But yet it is not something to be, to be hated or even something to be feared. St. Paul tells us in his second letter to Timothy, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. And of course, he's referring to baptism. But I think he's also referring to those further deaths that the Christian must make. The death of avoiding violations of the Ten Commandments. 
the death of fulfilling the duties of one's state in life, whatever it requires, the death of fidelity to the, to the teachings and the discipline of the church, all the many thousands of ways through life that we die to self to live for God, to live for the truth. And of course, that includes the voluntarily chosen penances and so on that we undertake, and the penance of suffering which we experience in life. So all of these things, we die with Christ so that we may rise with him through the power of the Holy Spirit which has been given to us in baptism. This sensibility was so strong in Paul that in Philippians, um, he says, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. We have other witnesses to this attitude, for instance, in the life of St. Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus, when she says in her first chapter of her life, I want to see God, and in order to see him, I must die. And I think she means not only that ultimate death at the end of life, but the many dyings uh, that I noted earlier. And finally, in the preface of Christian death, the first preface that is in the Roman Missal for the Mass of Christian Burial, it says, Lord, for your faithful people, life has changed, not ended. When the body of our earthly dwelling lies in death, we gain an everlasting dwelling place in heaven. So the end of man's earthly pilgrimage is death and judgment and glory if that, is, uh, if that is what we merit in Christ. It is not, as other views might suggest, reincarnation or some other life or annihilation if we are evil, as some theologies uh, uh, that are about would suggest, but rather it is to await that glorious end of history when the body will be reunited to the soul and we will attain to the perfection of the glory that God intends for us. Everlasting life or eternal life is that life which begins with our death, with the separation of our soul from the body. And it is a life that will have no end, that will be forever and ever. It's preceded after death by the particular judgment in which Christ judges, he who is the just judge, and awards to the living and the dead their appropriate uh, destinies. And this particular judgment, or personal judgment as it could also be called, will be confirmed in a final judgment at the end of history. The judgment which occurs at the end of each life, at the, after death, is called the particular judgment, or it could also be called the personal judgment. The New Testament affirms that each person will be rewarded immediately after death in accordance with his works and accordance with his faith. And this, as we noted earlier, is taught in many places in sacred scripture. Each person receives his eternal recompense in his immortal soul at this moment, in that particular judgment that refers his life to the life of Christ. There is either entrance into the blessedness of heaven through the purification of purgatory if necessary, or immediately and into everlasting damnation. As St. John of the Cross puts, puts it, at the evening of our life, we shall be judged on our love. This simply repeats that great uh, tribute to love which St. Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 13, when he says, if we speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love, then I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge and have all faith so as to move mountains but have not love, I gain nothing. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is, of course, profoundly true because faith gives ways to vision and ends. Hope gives way to arriving at the destination and end. But love is love of God, love of neighbor, is something that will continue forever and ever into eternity. Everyone has heard of heaven, but few seem to know what it is. 
They know that it's with God. They understand that. But what does the church understand? Well, it understands that it's with God for those who die in God's grace and friendship and are perfectly purified and will be forever with Christ. In fact, we can quote Revelations 21 where it speaks of the heavenly Jerusalem at the end of time and how only the pure will enter in. Nothing imperfect will enter in to that heavenly Jerusalem. This perfect life with the Holy Trinity is a communion of life and love with God, with Mary and all the angels and saints, and is called heaven. If we go back to what I said earlier about the plan of God, from the communion of the Holy Trinity comes a decision to create, to renew that creation when it falls and to sanctify and glorify it, that everything comes from God and returns to God. Everything comes from the communion of the Holy Trinity and returns to that communion of the Holy Trinity, the communion of the three divine persons. And so this is the path that we are on into which we will be taken in as Mary and the saints and angels already are. Heaven is the ultimate end and fulfillment of all that we hope for in this world and of all our longings, the state of supreme and definitive happiness. The church explains that, of course, by way of the beatific vision, that in seeing God in our soul, we find full satisfaction and fulfillment in that. We are with Christ in heaven, and we achieve our full identity, our perfect identity. Now, we can't perfectly understand this, of course, because as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But we can get from Scripture the happiness of those who journeyed with Christ on earth, the happiness of the saints who have, who have passed through the travails of life as we are currently passing through them, and we can see a glimpse of that happiness to which we ourselves are called, of that perfect communion of love uh, which will be granted to us at the end. There is, of course, no pain and suffering in heaven. St. Dominic said to his brothers, Do not weep, for I shall be more useful to you after my death, and I shall help you then more effectively than during my life. This was echoed pretty much many centuries later by St. Teresa of Lisieux, who in her final conversation said, I want to spend my heaven in doing good on earth. The saints have all had this perspective that greater good can be done when one is with God than one is apart from God. And for those who are with God, greater good in heaven than if we were on earth. And so they always longed and looked for the consummation of the communion with God, which they began here in this world with baptism and with the grace that God gave them in that baptism. St. John, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, says regarding the heavenly Jerusalem, nothing unclean shall enter into it. The church has had this conviction from the beginning that their purification would be necessary for those who die in God's grace and friendship, but with the dross of sin and the kinds of human uh, defects uh, that we all have but yet they are assured of their eternal salvation and the judgment of Christ is that they will receive it after undergoing purification. Our Lord himself alludes to this in the Sermon on the Mount when in chapter 5 of Matthew we hear uh, regarding the just judge, settle with the judge on the way 
lest when you get there you are thrown into prison and you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. Our Lord never spoke of trivialities. He was not speaking about earthly affairs. He was speaking about the affairs of the Spirit. And so we must settle on the way to the tribunal of Christ that occurs after our death, or else we will settle afterwards. And this is what the doctrine of purgatory is telling us as well. The name purgatory, of course, refers to the purgation or purification of sins, that refining with fire that scriptures speaks of with connection to the sons of Levi, that purifying fire which cleans away the dross of the base metals out of the pure gold or, or silver. The church's sacred tradition refers to certain scriptures, of course, when speaking of this cleansing fire. 1 Corinthians 3 is one of those where we are told, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on a foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will be made manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. And so the church understands this of purgatory and other similar texts, such as in Maccabees, where uh, Judas Maccabeus sends uh, money to the temple to pray for sacrifices to be offered on behalf of his fallen soldiers. All of these things lead us to the conviction that despite the good that we do in this life, it oftentimes has many imperfections. And we must either uh, correct those while we are alive, or the Lord will purify those out of his just after our death. And that purification is called purgatory. The souls that are in purgatory are receiving that purification which is necessary to restore to them perfect justice, as if they had not sinned. Uh, usually with our sins there is some imperfection of motive or circumstance that makes it less than a perfectly good act, a good act nonetheless. It is that which is being corrected. But the church gives the faithful here in the church militant the possibility of contributing not to their purification, but to the satisfaction that is owed to justice, to God, for uh, the, the faults and the defects, the temporal faults and punishment that is due to the works uh, which we carry with us into the next life. And so from the very beginning of the church's life, and we find this in the fathers of the church, for the deceased, the mass would be offered in suffrage for them. St. Monica insisted that her son Augustine pray for her and offer the holy sacrifice after her death because already the church had this conviction and acted upon it in her everyday life for those who had passed away in faith. And so this is something that we ourselves can do to offer our prayers uh, on behalf of, uh, of the poor souls, uh, to offer indulgences. We can gain indulgences for ourselves, we can't gain them for other living human beings, but the church says we can offer them for the souls in purgatory for individual souls or for the souls in purgatory generally. And so, doing so with our alms, with our indulgences and our works of penance is a great charity that we can do for others, for those who have died, and hope and pray that others will also extend that charity to us when we die. Well, no one wants to talk about hell, of course, but it's a necessary part of the teaching of the church because it recognizes that while there is divine love and divine mercy, there is also divine justice for those uh, who do not accept the mercy that God extends to them. And so they must be set right uh, with a punishment that is suited uh, 
uh, to the sin that they committed. And sins against God have an infinite uh, uh, demerit to them. And so the punishment for such sins is also infinite. We cannot be united to God unless we have chosen to love him. And if we choose not to love him, we cannot be surprised that he chooses not to extend the full be blessings and benefits or any of the blessings and benefits of, of glory to us. If we sin gravely against God, against our neighbor or ourselves, then we can do, we can expect what uh, John tells us in his first letter, chapter 3. We know that we have passed out of death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So if eternal life does not abide in us, if sanctifying grace is not in us at the moment of death, then we've already chosen our lot. We have chosen our fate. And hell is that uh, place to which Christ uh, will consign us. The church teaches, as the catechism does in paragraph 1033, to die in mortal sin without repenting and accepting God's merciful love means remaining separated from him forever by our own choice. The state of definitive self-exclusion from communion with God and the blessed is called hell. Pope John Paul II famously in discourses on, on heaven and, and hell uh, during his pontificate noted that hell is essentially this separation from God, which is to say that the, 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 the essential element of punishment is to never see God. Now, the church acknowledges other aspects to the punishment that the individual receives. Uh, there are no friends in hell, so it's not a very good company to be in. And the church acknowledges the temporal fire that uh, Scripture and the fathers of the church and doctors and theologians uh, throughout uh, history have attributed to hell without knowing how God brings that about. But nonetheless, this secondary element of punishment is something that is part of that uh, deposit of the faith as well. Nonetheless, the chief punishment is this eternal s separation from God, which is its essential characteristic. Even the devils, as they went about the earth harassing Christ or tempting us, uh, have that experience of the separation from God with them constantly, even though they are not in the place of hell. And so uh, that is... Uh, that is a circumstance which is additional to this uh, essential characteristic of hell. The teaching of Scripture and the Fathers affirm this kind of fire, but it should be for us not so much something that provokes fear, but a call to conversion. As Matthew says in chapter 7, quoting our Lord, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I don't think our Lord intended the few to be an occasion of discouragement for us. But rather to note the difficulties. And the, di the difficulties of the temptations we experience in life. And we can only will count ourselves not among the few if we ever forget that God is merciful and loving and good. And if we turn to him, he will accept us and we will never have to experience the reality of hell. One of the most challenging questions in theology is how is it that there is a hell and that those who live evil lives will go to hell. The first principle of understanding this, I think, is that God predestines no one to hell. To the extent that we make choices in life, this is a willful decision on our part, that we prefer the company of evil over the company of good, the company of error over the company of truth, and therefore the company of the devil and the other evil human beings over the company of God, the angels, and the saints. So God does not desire the punishment of anybody. 
just as parents do not desire to punish their children. But the results of behavior sometimes is to arrive at an end that could have been foreseen but was not, but is strictly the consequence of one's own moral choices in life. And hell is such a place, as prison is for those of us who uh, commit crimes here in this world. In the Roman Missal, in uh, Evening Prayer 1, we are told, Father, accept this offering from your whole family. Grant us your peace in this life. Save us from final damnation. And count us among those you have chosen. So we want to not be accounted among those who are damned, those who have chosen uh, an evil way of life and an evil destination. In God, justice and love are one. It's the simplicity of the divine nature, that it's indivisible. And so you can't separate his justice on the one hand from his love, or as John Paul II put it in his, in his encyclical on the divine mercy, that mercy is love as it reaches out to the sinner. But some sinners say, no, get away from me, Lord. I do not want your mercy. And the result of that necessarily is God's justice. So the sinner chooses his punishment, though God's justice is necessarily experienced by him as punishment. The choice is always ours, even though God has foreknown what that choice will be. And this is true of those we encounter in the world who seem to be on that path, a path we should never presume and a path that we should always hope to divert those we encounter from by our example and by our own life of living for heaven. We talked earlier about the particular judgment, the judgment of the individual soul who dies and goes before Christ to be judged. What then is the last judgment? The beautiful mural at the back of the Sistine Chapel depicting uh, God's judgment uh, on the world at the end of time. What does that add to the picture of the particular judgment that each individual will receive? Well, certainly the situation in the context of the end of history is one element of that. At the end of the world, in that cosmic upheaval we mentioned earlier, is, among other things, the last judgment. And so the resurrection of the dead, just and unjust, will precede this last judgment. And in the, again, the presence of Christ, as on the occasion of the particular judgment, the truth of each man's relationship with God will be laid bare. When Jesus said that every secret will be brought out, all things done in darkness will be brought into the light, he was speaking of this. Because for the most part, we go through life and our sins are taken care of in the confessional. There are elements that are hidden of our life that are not revealed to the light of day. And we think, thank goodness, you know, my mother, my father don't know about this. But at the end, they will, because everything will be revealed. And that's sort of an awesome thought that we have to keep in mind. It is not a recapitulation of the private judgment, however. And I think very often of the Jesuit expression, the Jesuit motto, ad maiorum gloriam dei, to the greater glory of God. In the last judgment, we will see collectively as a human race the workings out of grace, of mercy, and yes, of justice. And we will see how all of history has unfolded by God's providence and by his will, bringing us to this moment at the end of time. And all of that will be for the glory of God and the glory of those who were instrumentals in that. Our Lady, the saints, the angels, the popes, the clergy, the parents, the, uh, those who did great works for God, for their neighbor, and so on. All of that will be seen and glorify God and us that is what the purpose of the last judgment is that distinguishes it from the particular judgment we receive at the end of our life. These last events, the cosmic upheaval, the last judgment, the general resurrection, 
are all associated with the parousia, the coming of Christ in glory at the end of time. This is when the last judgment will occur, therefore, a time that only the Father knows the day and the hour. Though, as I've said, we have been given certain signs that along the way can be milestones that we can look to to see, well, how far into history are we really? In the end, Christ himself will pronounce the final word on history, not, not historians, not the church. And we shall know the ultimate meaning of all creation and of the entire economy of salvation and understand the ways by which God led everything to its final end, which is him. It will not be simply anticlimactic that the material universe participates in the glory of the sons and daughters of God. For we've been promised that at the end of time when everything is brought to pass, that we will be given a new heavens and a new earth. Now what does this mean? This means that the glory that is given to the soul and that is given to the bodies of the resurrected bodies of the just will also be given then to the universe itself, and it will be transformed in ways which we cannot even understand uh, in, in the least. After the universal judgment, then the righteous enter into their reign forever with Christ, this renewal of the universe will take place. The Catechism in 1042 quotes the constitu dogmatic constitution on the Church Lumen Gentium, number 48, in saying, the church will receive her perfection only in the glory of heaven. When will come the time of the renewal of all things? At that time, together with the human race, the universe itself, which is so closely related to man and which attains its destiny through him, will be perfectly reestablished in Christ. In 2 Peter 3 and in Revelation 21, we have other texts regarding this mysterious renewal which will transform humanity and the world into a new heavens and a new earth. The book of Revelation tells us in chapter 21 that uh, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Neither shall be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And in Romans, St. Paul tells us for creation awaits with eager expectation the revelation of the children of God. For creation was made subject to futility, not of its own accord, but because of the one who subjected it in hope, that creation itself would be set free from slavery to corruption and share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that all creation is groaning in labor pains even until now. And not only that, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we also groan within ourselves as we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. So this final realization of the unity of the human race will be something that is not apart from creation. The Pilgrim Church has been living in the nature of a sacrament, a communion with God, with Christ, through Christ, and the resurrection will give to all the just a communion among themselves with God the Father through Christ. And then that will be extended to the creation itself, which has been uh, groaning, as we are told by Paul, uh, awaiting this final revelation, this final redemption of the sons of God. The visible universe, therefore, is destined to be transformed. St. Irenaeus, in his writings against the heresies of his day, said,
The world itself restored to its original state, facing no further obstacles, should be at the service of the just. Or as the Roman Missal in Preface 4 of Easter puts it, for with the old order destroyed, a universe cast down is renewed, and integrity of life is restored to us in Christ. We can perhaps think of the glorious plan that the Father had that I spoke of in the very first uh, part of these sessions. And that is that coming from the communion which the Father, Son, and Spirit has, there was this gift of creation which then fell, redeemed in Christ, and at the end restored in Christ, and achieves a destiny that it could not have achieved apart from Christ and his cross. This is that O oh, happy fault of the exultad of Easter morning when we give thanks for that paradoxical reality that had Adam and Eve not sinned, we would not have had Christ, we would not have had the church, we would not have sacraments. Those very things with, by which Christ and God the Father and the Spirit will renew the world at the end of time. St. Paul sums this up perfectly in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 15, when he says, For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead came also through a human being. For just as in Adam all die, so too in Christ shall all be brought to life, but each one in proper order. Christ the first fruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he subjected everything under his feet. And when he says everything has been subjected, it is clear he excludes the one who subjected everything to him. When everything is subjected to him, that is to Christ, then the Son himself will be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. So truly, O oh happy fault, O oh necessary sin of Adam, who gave us so great a Redeemer and so great a destiny. <laughs>